you know what, more important than anything, and I love playing drums, but it's got to be fun. Absolutely. It's not, but it's not about the money. I mean, I want to get paid, but yeah. I, you know, I do it because it's fun. If it stops being fun, I'm going to stop doing it. Yeah. It's not that important to, to be behind the drums and, and not like it. John, this is fantastic to have you here. You know, I've known you for many, many years, and you are a real steady performing musician, doing what you love doing, continuing, and there's a message in how you have had your career, which has always been in impressing to me. <laughs> Welcome to the sessions. Thank you so thank, much. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Where did, where did this begin? How did drumming and music enter your life at a young age? My family was, uh, my father of all things played accordion, mm. not professionally, but there was an accordion in the house. Uh, my mother played piano and, and sang, again, not professionally, but there was a piano in the house and, and she used to sing on the radio. We lived in Chicago and she was kind of a child prodigy back in the 30s. My brother actually took drum lessons mm. and uh, I actually took accordion lessons. <laughs> well, he switched to guitar, I inherited his drums and started taking drum lessons. I was I just turned nine years old. and. Uh, Love playing drums. I, I was listening to, uh, this was the mid-60s, and I was listening to uh, not only the pop music on the radio, I was a big fan of the Beatles, of course, and all yeah. sorts of pop music, but my parents had albums by Gene Krupa, uh, Latin orchestras, uh, and comedy albums. They had Alan Sherman albums. Oh, it was really, okay. it was a very broad, you know, I'm listening to Ringo, I'm listening to Hal Blaine, I'm listening yeah. to Gene Krupa, <laughs> and Alan Sherman making fun of stuff. It just, and, <laughs> and it didn't take long before I decided how cool it would be to be a professional drummer. I didn't know what that entailed. Uh, or, or how to do it. I mean, I was probably 12 years old when I announced, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to be a drummer. I'd like to do this for a living. I got lucky. I mean, honestly, yeah. I mean, it's just, I, I don't want to say I had a plan or a career path. I probably should have. It, maybe it would have hastened it a little bit. <laughs> but it just, it, it happened in spite of that. I mean, I, I think for some people it, it happens or it doesn't. And it's, it's the luck of the draw. And I'm very, really is. And I'm lucky and I'm privileged. I feel very privileged to be doing it. Which is where fate comes in. We never know where this Absolutely. will take us for sure. But well, it's right place and right time. And, and sadly, we don't know where that is. Absolutely. And, and, and you were there at that time. So and I, I was there. Lessons. Did you take lessons from teachers? Was it a formal kind of a studying? I, I did. I started with lessons. I mean, I literally, again, I've got a whole drum set at home, but I'm, I'm going in with a snare drum. It was a very small studio. I'm yeah. learning to read, learning rudiments. It was such a small studio that it's like, well, if you had a bass drum, you would tap your foot because we didn't have a bass drum. In there. I mean, eventually, <laughs> they brought in a cymbal was, was my introduction lesson-wise to a kit. But I'm at home playing to Beatles records and stuff. So, I mean, I already am familiar enough. But I had a, a formal, uh, I had several teachers for several years. I played in school bands. So I had a sense of being conducted and working with other players and stuff like that. I had other combos and, and musicians that I played with at home. Nice. Not to any end, but yeah. just we got together once or twice a week and just and made music. Now I taped all of those things. I, I have some pretty horrible and some pretty cool recordings. <laughs> I mean I did I was young and I took chances. Yeah, I took chances yeah. that I, that for better or worse I don't take anymore. Some of the chances were not good. It's good that I don't take those kind of chances. And some of them were like, I didn't know any better, and I did some pretty cool stuff. Well, what, I, what do you think, what, why do you think you did that? What, what was it about you that, that you took those I, chances? I didn't know. I didn't know the difference. Now, again, I'm, I'm you know, in my teens, yeah. and, and I really didn't know. Now, I listened to a lot of pop records, which is a lot of relatively restrained drumming. So I had a sense of you know, two and four, but fills and things like that, I, I would just do stuff, things that I thought sounded good, and some of them genuinely did, and some of them genuinely didn't. And, and eventually I learned the difference. I'd like yeah. to think I learned the difference. <laughs> but at the time, I just didn't know. And, there was, and I didn't have any mentors at the time. Uh, you know, teachers were, they taught you how to read in a book, but they didn't teach you any kind of real world, hey, when you're out there actually playing with a bass player and a piano player and a guitar player, and maybe right. a horn player and a singer, you know, it's this way. Yeah. You know, you're not necessarily going to do you're not going to do five stroke rolls you know, and play and play three camps and do stuff like that. You're going to play a beat and you're not going to be the featured guy in the group probably. You're going to be just sort of, but no one told me that. Yeah. I eventually, you know, I eventually got it. And like when you mentioned three camps, certain you know, phrases that some of the kids might not know when they're watching this, oh. it was a rudimental piece that, that you know, meant that if a, if a drummer started playing a lot of this stuff, they were overplaying in the process. Yeah, so that's, well that's, these, these were rudimental drum solos, so yeah. a lot of chops, and just on the snare, so it was a yeah. lot of chops. Yeah, yeah. And, and not that I was a chops drummer, but I just, some of these things I did were, were uh, wildly inappropriate. And so, no one was there to tell me not to. Not even the other players. They weren't, yeah. wouldn't say like, what, you know, what was that wacky you know, <laughs> fill that covered up everything? It's, it's, they let me do it. And 
uh, maybe fortunately I have recordings to keep me in check because I listen to this stuff. It's like that was good, but those other ten fills were. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. And and I know you know I know much better. I have a much better sense of really what not to do. Yeah. If I just avoid the stuff I shouldn't do, I end up doing things I should do. That you should do. That's, well, that's really good, good advice. So were, were there specific books you were working out of? Was it were there like you know drumming books that you were working out of that you were practicing on or? I had, I mean, I have the fabled uh, advanced studies, you know, the blue book with the red binder. The I mean, Jim, Mike still the, has the, the red Jim binder. Book, right? The Jim Chapin yeah. book, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I had some other specific, there was a around the drums with paradiddles or some kind of things. Yeah. I mean, there were some things I did. Got a Louis Belson book. My I mean, text you know, readings. So you had several I, books that you had that you were going through. Yeah. Interesting. And, and once I had learned to read, obviously, sourcing information from books, I mean, I didn't think of it at the time, but it was really like, I can go at my own pace, fast or slow. Right. Uh, and I know just enough to know if I'm playing the notes right or not. I mean, I've already got whatever technique I've got down. I mean, I've already learned the, the logistics uh, of, of moving around a kit. Now I can read it all without having to do that with a teacher so you have, telling me, here, read that. I can great, do that myself. Great, great, because you had fundamentals, you were in position. Yeah. So the, the bands, you mentioned the Beatles, right, in the 60s. Who, what other bands were you listening to at that time? Well, I, you know, whatever was on the radio, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say I really had a record collection at the time. Now, my brother, who had switched to guitar, was like very country music. So I wasn't, I was aware, but that's not really what I was listening to. Mm -hmm. I listened to pop radio, which at the time, you might hear Tom Jones and Petula Clark and the Rolling Stones yeah. and Motown stuff. Yeah, it was a wide variety. Of it was, all, had, it wasn't yeah. as, as uh, narrow casting. Yeah. You know, it was very broadcasting. The original concept was, well, here's a radio station, and it's it's not classical, and it's not easy listening, so it's everything else. Uh, yeah. Pop. And pop back then was was R&B and Motown That's and right. Beach Boys right, and yeah, solo yeah. artists and a very wide appreciation of different stuff, but, you know, mostly stuff that was in common. A lot of two and four. I mean, a lot of the stuff I listened to, uh, I love the Turtles, you know, the, uh, did I, I don't know if I mentioned the Beach Boys, Paul Revere and the Raiders, yeah. Association. <laughs> now, in some of those groups, there's a common thread. You got Hal Blaine. <laughs> so, wasn't <laughs> even aware of his name at the time, but I, I later learned that, well, yeah, Ringo and Hal Blaine were certainly my biggest influences, with a touch of Gene Krupa. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I have a love for that. I wasn't really aware of who Buddy Rich was, and if I was, it was like, well, he's, he's way too technical, and, and you know, and, and, and Krupa swung. I mean, Krupa was great. You know, it's amazing, and, and that's what, and these names that you're mentioning is so important that when people watch this here, to go and research Gene Krupa, go research these fantastic drummers that came before us, because, listen, Gene was a phenomenal superstar at his time. He was yeah. huge. He, I think he was in over a hundred movies, just with his band. And you mentioned Hal Blaine again. We've interviewed Hal Blaine here for the sessions. Fantastic interview. And I told Hal in person. I said, Hal, in, my, in the sixties, growing up in the seventies, my ten favorite drummers. I found out that <laughs> you were nine of them. You know, really, what has happened? He played so many recordings. So, yeah. so you had that kind of influence. Fantastic. So how? So now, you, are, are, you, do you start, are you starting to play with bands? You're you're starting to play out with different musicians. I think the first actual band I was, other than school bands, I was probably fifteen. And I had met some people at a time when that, this was weird. They went to a different school, different high school than me. And so I don't know how we connected, hmm. but somehow we did. It was a flute player and a piano player, and that was it. Hmm. No bass, no drums. Hmm. We just got together, and now I became part of their uh, uh, duo. Now we were a trio. Wow. And we didn't... Uh, and we just, we got together, we had a piano in the house, and, and so they would ride over on their bikes. I mean, none of us had cars yet. <laughs> I dragged my drums downstairs and sent them up in the living room where the piano was, and uh, the flute player would play, and the piano player would play, and I'd play, and we did, uh, this was like 71, maybe 72, and so we did what they wanted to do. Right, right. I mean, we did stuff like Imagine, and, and, some, th and some odd, really one-note samba, and just some weird stuff. Spain Tony by Chick Corea. Beam, Chick Corea stuff. Yeah, just been, weird stuff that they wanted cool to play because they were yeah. like really into doing stuff. And I just wanted to play, you know, She Loves You. So, <laughs> uh, we did stuff from uh, uh, the Jesus Christ Superstar soundtrack, which was kind of a, a rockin' thing yes, for the most absolutely. part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was where I first learned to play. Was it 5-4? 5-4 five, four? Five, four or 7. Something like that. One of the songs was in. Yeah. I don't know if it was King Herod's song. There was one song, and they didn't warn me. And we're playing along, and, and I started fumbling, and they had to explain to me that there was something more than, you know, just 4-4. Four, four. <laughs> and that was my first touch of, and I immediately got it, not that I did it great, but I immediately got how to count 
one or two or three extra beats in a measure and come back and find one again. So this was like really on-the-job training. You were really uh, yeah. just kind of like learning and going and putting yourself in situations yeah. to keep on board. That's a very, very important message that you involved yourself in situations for you to learn. Well, I could I could hear it and, and translate it from here to here to here. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe it took a second, but I very quickly got the concept, concept of seven and later learned that we did uh, take five. So Paul Desmond I, playing sax, my yeah. teacher Joe Morello on drums, it was pretty amazing to ex mm. experience what that song did in 5-4, yeah. this jazz song in 5-4 with a drum solo in it being played on the radio, so that influenced the song. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that was one. So I guess I knew five four without even thinking about that. That yeah. well, it's not it's not straight rock or whatever. It didn't matter because that song was what it was. Mm -hmm. So this other, you know, I was introduced to yet another time signature by way of these guys. Yeah. Well, uh, nothing. I, we, we were kids. We gradually added a bass player. We went on to perform in the L.A. County Battle of the Bands, which was a real like Parks and Recreation Department put mm -hmm. on this. They had a fund for you know youth programs or whatever it was keep kids off the streets or whatever they did. Mm -hmm. and, and the Battle of the Bands was like a real thing, but like at a, at a you know, official level. And, the, and we made our way up all the prelims, and the final contest was at the Hollywood Bowl. Mm -hmm. So I'm, this was 1974, I'm you know, 17 maybe at the time, yeah. and playing at the Hollywood Bowl. And we, and we tied for first place, and it was only <laughs> a tie because there was a country band, and the judges, which was Pete Christlieb, uh, Tom Scott, yeah. uh, Mercer Ellington, who was Duke's son, yeah, great a couple, couple other folks, like some legitimate people in the business, yeah. and and they couldn't they couldn't decide, you know, because we were doing we did Fire and Rain like in seven, <laughs> and then we did Spain, and uh, and and did uh, did nice, and they were impressed with that, and then here's this other band doing kind of bluegrassy stuff, and they didn't know, so they just they gave it to us both. So you're getting <laughs> teased by playing at these venues, oh, playing this kind of music. You're getting teased, and you're getting sucked into this music industry that is really just, and that's what happens to us all. We get sucked into it, and, and we just can't let it go. And I didn't know what came next. Yeah. It just was, was starting to happen. And it was cool, and I, I went to school. I mean, I had uh, day jobs and stuff. I mean, I did, you know, I don't want to say that I sat at home and, and practiced all day long, you know, but I was, I, I had the passion, I applied my Myself wherever I could. I played with as many players as I could. Um, I d did demos and stuff around LA. Yeah. I mean, I put myself out there and and got known and applied myself. Mm. And it just it gradually, even though I didn't know where it was going, it was going. I mean, it was just yes. it was happening yeah. without me uh, engineering or create. It just you know it was gradually happening. And I don't think I knew that. But I, a, looking back, what a great positive wave of fate! I mean, it was just kind of going absolutely. Along. So when at this point, so when did you meet up with Weird Al? How did that connection happen? Well, there's a story that <laughs> about why I happened to be where Al was that night. Uh huh. These friends I had now back in the in the early '70s, I didn't know really guitar players or any stuff like that. You know, I was in school bands that were trumpet and clarinet and trombone players and stuff like that. So. Everyone back in the day, Dr. Demento did a live show in L.A. Yeah. Sunday nights, and he was kind of a musicologist. Played a lot of novelty stuff, a lot of obscure jazz things. I mean, a lot of really cool stuff. But the junior high and high school kids just dug it. We just <laughs> listened to it and just sit in front of the radio <laughs> and listen to this. I used to tape the shows. I mean, I just, I, I was, I was sucked in. <laughs> so there was one song that he played, uh, and it got requested a lot. There was like a top ten list of, of listener requests. And, and this song was called Pico and Sepulveda. It was done by, I can't remember the guy's real name, but he went by Felix Figueroa. And Figueroa is a street here in L.A. Here in L.A., yeah. And this Pico and Sepulveda are intersections in, in West Los Angeles, which actually I live very close. Anyway, the song was just getting requested all the time, and, and Dr. Demento said, you know, we're going to run a contest. We want you to, to make you, it's, it's the roll your own Pico and Sepulveda contest. You do your own version of Pico and Sepulveda, send it in, and the winner will get a 78 of the record. And the, the second place will get a couple of 45s that will sign, uh, stuff like that. But anyway, that was, so I got some of my horn player friends together. Uh, this is one of the guys from this uh, flute piano group, a guy named Jeff Rona, who went on to become a big uh, Hollywood scoring guy. He's worked with, he's one of the guys on the committee that invented MIDI. He became, he went way beyond the flute. Uh, he's done oh. very, very well. Had a guy on sax named Richard Elliott. Who you might know that name. Yeah, sure. Uh, he denies having done that. Uh, he was there. He was there. <laughs> uh, had a guy named Barry Keys on trombone, who I think went on to be in the Donnette Show Band. Yeah. Had some good play, but they, they were still kids. Yeah. It's just we all sort of did some cool things. We did this recording of Pico and Sepulveda in my bedroom and sent it in to Dr. Demento. And we came in actually second place 
out of over 100 entries. We came in second place, but he used our version as the theme for the show for a while because we did an instrumental. So he could talk over it that as you know as the show started. And we thought, oh, how cool it is to get something played on the radio. It took a little while, but we got back together and we recorded another song. <laughs> and that got played on the radio. And then we, you know, a year went by and we did another song. That got played on the radio. Well, I was later asked to come down to the Dr. Demento show. This is 1980 now. And the show has by this point, some years later, has, has begun to cater to a lot of homemade music uh, and independent artists and stuff. You know, there's yeah. still a touch of the old novel stuff, but I mean, a lot of, you know, we'd hear Alan Sherman one song and then some guy from St. Louis the next, you know, who just <laughs> had sent something in. So the doctor thought it would be interesting if, if I, uh, to interview someone that had stuff, homemade music played very early on for whatever reason. Anyway, that was September 14th, 1980. Weird Al was already coming up on the show as he was sort of the in-house parody guy and he would hang around there and answer phones and do PSAs and just was sort of one of the cast, one of the crew guys. But he was getting a lot of stuff played on the Dr. Demento show. So he was there that night. And, uh, we met, of course, and he was debuting a song he had just written that weekend called Another One Rides the Bus, which is a parody of Queen's Another One Bites the Dust. <laughs> and now there weren't instruments. I mean, he plays accordion. Yeah. and. And uh, his accordion case is there, and there's other guys in there with little squeakers and hand claps and stuff. And Al says, "Would, would you want to play the beat on the accordion case? We're going to do this live on the air. You know, just sort of debut the song on the air." I said, I, "Sure." So we rehearsed it in the hallway a little bit, pretty straight ahead, and I'm just and I'm beating on his accordion case, and anyway, Dr. Demento rolled tape on it, actually made a proper recording, you know, stereo recording in the room. So we have that, it actually it became a single. About what year is this now? This is September, this is 1980, so it's 19, September 14th, 80. 1980. And, and that was, now Al actually had already had a single out on Capitol, My Bologna, for My Sharona. Yeah. But that came and went, and that was strictly a novel thing and a one single deal, and, and you know, for which he got like 500 bucks, which in 1979, and he's in college, he fantastic. probably thought that might as well have been a million. Sure, fantastic. So they still own that song, by the way. Anyway, oh, one other thing about Al. He also had sent in a version of Pico and Sepulveda several years earlier. Uh, he did not win, but we yeah we had a good time discussing yes, that later, but, uh, as as we found out a little later on what we both you know, our, our involvement with the show. But but very quickly, so there's another one rides the bus. Right. Uh, the Doctor Demento show by this time now was syndicated. He's on like 200 stations across the U.S. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it usually aired on a Sunday night. That was a slot where they had to fill a couple of hours. Well, in in most markets they have some wacky morning zoo drive time, you know, jocks doing stuff, being crazy, playing wacky stuff and doing wacky stories and commercials, parodies and things like that. And they would harvest stuff from the Demento show that aired at their station the oh, night before. Right. So all of a sudden now, another one rides the bus, goes out syndicated the following Monday morning in morning drive time, very important, <laughs> they're playing another one rides the bus. <laughs> so now Al is, has got exposure not just to the Demento audience, now he's getting played to People going to work and going to school, what? and this this was one of this Brilliant. was one of several turning points. I Brilliant. want to say, Brilliant. but at, at a time when radio could do that and yeah. would do that, well, maybe it still happens. I don't know. Well, but that, that, that was a very magical time. And what was uh, going yeah. on at that time? Yeah. So you know, so MTV started around that time. Uh, we we didn't hadn't had any videos at that point. Right. Uh, early on, Al and I just did some recordings and got whoever. My brother came in and played bass and guitar sometimes on right. some things. We recorded stuff in his garage on Al's Porta Studio unit, the cassette four track cassette unit. Yeah. But Al knew he had a whole flow chart of we're going to do this and this, and then we're going to bounce it over to this track. Then I'm going to do the vocals and bounce it over here, and then we're going to do a lead vocal and then bounce, it, and then we're going to do sound effects. And he'd mix it, and he'd somehow get a stereo track out of bouncing this thing back and forth within itself. <laughs> And he just, he's very methodical that way, and he's yeah. still methodical that way. He's very hands-on, uh, he's a very good director, very good producer. Mm. He knows what he wants, and he also knows when he's got it. Uh, he's directed well, he's directed his own videos for years, yeah. and they've gone very, very well, because he knows when a scene works, he knows to move on. A lot of guys will direct something, that was great, that was perfect, let's do another one. Absolutely. And it's like, no, that's, that's what I want, let's move on. Yeah, yeah. Let's not spend that's... four days on this, let's do it in two. Let's do it in one. But when you know what you want and you have those kind of leadership skills, you can move yep. quickly and get things done. Yeah, and he's he's that way. He's absolutely that way. Interesting. I don't want to say he's anal, mm. but I will say he's very meticulous. Yeah. And and that's part of the success of his stuff. That's part of the success of doing a parody 
of, of somebody's song that people know mm. and doing it as dead on as we can because he knows, well, it helps also that the band knows what the, what the goal is. And it's like, you know, it's not enough to play the part, it's got to sound like it. Absolutely. And he knows when he's, he's been producing his own albums for quite some time. Yeah. So he knows how to do that. We know how to work with him. That's also the beauty of the, we're the same guys that were there in the beginning. So he has all the same band now for the past 37 years? Well, it's been, these guys came on the beginning of 82 in time to record the first album and never left. <laughs> so we got Steve J on bass, yeah. who's, a, who's an excellent world-class uh, rhythmic funk bass player. I mean, he's just, he's, he's very technically musically yeah, skilled, musically yeah. trained. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim Kimo West, Kimo is Hawaiian for Jim. He's a great rocker, but he, he's got an affection for Hawaiian music, slack key music, and is very well respected in that. They bring him to Hawaii to play slack key music. <laughs> uh, like they can't find some guys there or something. And, and then really? me on drums and Al on accordion typically, or keyboard at times. He, yeah. He's a pretty skilled keyboard player as well. Hmm. And that's the core band. Now we've had a couple of keyboard players float in and out. We've got our current touring keyboardist, Ruben Valtierra, who's the new guy. He's been with us since 91. Hmm. So he's the new guy and takes a lot of grief from us still. We're all a <laughs> bunch of old grown men, but we still, we still treat him like a kid. But the fun and, that you have and the creativity of what, what Al does is it's just so creative that you're in this creative engine of having fun and, and making a statement of this parody of these songs. It's incredible. It's, well, and, and there's originals as well along those lines. I mean, everything in him, it's not every, like everything's a joke, but yeah. everything's a joke. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's satirical and it's humorous. And there's a couple of songs that are maybe a little socially pointed, you yeah. know, leaning yeah. a little socially. You can't always tell which side of the, the aisle he's on. Yeah, yeah. But, but there's a couple of those and, th and those are obvious, but they're not, it's not something that would get him in trouble with anyone. Right. He's very good about language and, and stuff like that. And not because the kids haven't heard this stuff, right. but he doesn't need the parents to hear the kids hearing this and to stop buying the albums. Yeah. Uh, he, knows, he knows how to couch his language. He knows how to, if he wants to say something that's a little suggestive, it's very, very funny. And, yeah. and the kids don't get it. And then they wake up when they're 25 and go, oh, that's what that means. Oh, oh, that's very funny. Probably best I didn't know when I was eight years old what that line was about. Uh, so there's a little bit of blue, blue humor. If he's got to use a word, you know, and there's no way. I mean, and there's a lot of stuff that's certainly TV safe, and he doesn't even quite go there. He's, he's very careful. He's not, he's not Barney. He's not that clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. He's, he's very cognizant of, of what the kids hear and what the parents hear the kids hearing because the parents are the ones buying the tickets to the concerts Absolutely. and stuff like that. I mean, over the years, it's grown. I mean, the parents certainly come in on their own. They're bringing their kids. There's grandkids coming in. We got five and six-year-olds in the audience. We got 65-year-olds in the audience. It's an extremely wide demo. You know, 35 plus years on of recording and touring, there's there's a synergy in there, I mean, that you can't avoid. I mean, it's just, it happens when you work together that long. Absolutely. But I, I don't know any other bands that really have that level of span of age. There's very few. I mean, I, I can count them on this hand, <laughs> without my thumb. There, no, literally, there's, there's ZZ Top has been around with those three guys right. for a million years, right. uh, and still out there working. Aerosmith's been doing it with the same guys. Right. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Rush, kinda, sorta, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, U2 are probably the poster child for longevity, and right, right. their last album was a number one album, like ours. Yeah. And then there's us with the same guys, still making music, still attracting audiences, and having, at the end of a 14 album career with labels, having a number one album and then kissing the label goodbye. <laughs> at a time when, frankly, it's probably a good idea to do that. Absolutely. Having come up through that, we can do that. Yeah. It's, it's uh, you know, not coming up through that, I don't know that you would avoid a label, but I don't know what a label could do at this point. It's, it's a whole different ball game. It's a different world now. So how do you, you know, is, is there a, um, a way that you kind of map out the change? Like is a band going out touring and, and are, you, are you changing and adapting to the sign of the times? Well, the touring is the same for us, right. honestly. I mean, that's, and, and frankly, it's, it's turned around. I mean, back in the days you were touring, it was an expensive thing, but people would come see you play, then they'd go out and buy your catalog of albums mm. when albums were selling. Yeah. Now, the album uh, and singles and, and YouTube videos and whatever, whoever's running videos on TV and satellite and stuff, those videos become a promotional tool to help sell tickets to the right. uh, concerts, get them through the door, sell them some t-shirts, mm -hmm. give them a show. You know, it, it's, it's not hard to give away music and videos anymore. 
but they still got to pay to walk in the door and sit down and watch Absolutely. you play for a couple of hours. Absolutely. And and not to be mercenary about it, but that's really like the last, the, the last frontier of, of making real mm. money in music uh, anymore. And I, I'm not begrudging performing live because that's what I love to do. Yeah. I'd much rather do that than go in, cut an album, and sit, and not and not go out and play it, and not play gigs and get a bunch of money coming in the mail, you know, and and dribbles down to nothing one day yeah. and never go out and play. I'd rather go in the studio and make a few bucks yeah. and then go out and play. And, uh, go out and work it, work the material, yeah. yeah. I mean, to, to put it in perspective a little bit, we had a number one album, in, uh, and this is on the real, this is not the comedy charts, this is the Billboard 200 charts, mm -hmm. number one album uh, in uh, July of 2014. Our last album for Sony, and Al did not re-sign with them, which uh, so far so good. Sony was, the labels were never involved in our touring or any of that. So. Mm -hmm. They own all the product, as labels do. Yeah. We used to sell millions of albums. Yeah. Albums went gold and platinum routinely and quickly <laughs> with us when music was selling. Our last album, our number one album, was perhaps our worst selling album. Yeah, you know, by, by numbers, it was probably the worst selling album we've had, by far. <laughs> uh, no chance of it ever going gold. I mean, yeah. They're going to have to change the stats for what you know, constitutes a gold and a platinum album. You know, currently, for an album, it's 500,000 units sold is a gold album, one million is platinum, two million is double platinum, et cetera, et cetera, in the U.S. Uh, in countries with smaller populations, it's it's a, a fractional number of that. Canada, yeah. it's like 50,000 is uh, gold, right. for example. Right, right, right. Which is, is this essentially the same. Actually, mm -hmm. we do very well in Canada. We go in Australia, we'll go and we'll play like a 2,000-seater. That's like playing the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> That's that's big down there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, that's, and that's fine, you know, and, and we like that. Actually, I think what we do, you know, we played some nice big venues and some festivals. We've done Bonnaroo and, and stuff like that, uh, the Governor's Ball in New York City. I think playing a, you know, two thousand or three thousand seater, you know, it's a little more intimate. Yeah. You know, we have our show includes a, a, LED, a full on high def video. There's tracks we run because you know we can. It's only so many of us on stage, so there's percussion things that run and sometimes some nice vocals. You know, I'm, I'm not the best singer, that's for sure. And we're in we're in costumes. There's costume. Ch it's a show. I mean, it's a full on Broadway show. <laughs> Actually, for 2018, we've we've changed that. One, we don't have a new album to promote, so there's really not a theme. So what we're doing is, and this is this is a favor to the fans, the hardcore fans. We're doing a show that's almost entirely our originals, which is about half of what we do. The hardcore fans were always like, well, you know, we like the parodies, but we really like the originals. Well, we, the show's only so long, and we got to do the hits. We got to do right. the songs that are that the people know. Well, we want to hear the originals, or or you used to play this way back, and you don't play it anymore. I said, well, you've got other songs to replace it. You have 14 albums of original yeah. material. So. Yeah. This album is the uh, no frills, the ill-advised, deep cuts, you know, uh, no refunds tour. I mean, this is really, this is for the hardcores. And we're doing a, a series of like 1,500, 1,800 seat theaters, but we're not carrying the screen, we're not doing costumes, just the five of us uh, playing. Al's got a MIDI accordion now mm -hmm. that's got a bunch of great sounds. He's playing a lot of parts that he never had to play before to fill in, you know, yeah. what the server used to do. They're making me sing. That's how, you know, we don't have any uh, server with any pretty voices on it anymore. That's how, <laughs> that's how no frills it's become, is the drummer has to sing. But that's a part of the uniqueness of the sound. Uh, <laughs> it would certainly be unique. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, honestly, I, I sing fair. Yeah. Uh, he, if I'm, if I'm, we're rehearsing something and and it's just not working, he'll pull it away from me. He's yeah. just, you know, he knows better than to ruin his song. <laughs> but he throws a bunch of stuff at me, and if I can do it, that becomes my part. Mm. And there's a few things I can do. I would absolutely not call myself a singer. Uh, the fact that I'm willing to sing at all certainly helps cement my position in the group. Yeah. yeah. Other than the fact that I've been doing it for a million years, I also happen to be the band's archivist. Mm. Which is just something I always did. I always collected stuff I did, photos, posters, uh, recordings, I mean, re rehearsals, jams, whatever. I always kept, a, kept something that I did. And I did that with Al. Nice. To the extent that when we, when we did uh, Driven on VH1, or we did Behind the Music, or we did a biography channel special, or, or books, or whatever it is, I'm the guy they come to for photos. I'm the guy they come to for audio. I'm the guy they come to for dates that we did or anything funny that happened at a certain thing. That's I've great. got all of that. That's I had to remind great. Al of there was a sequence of songs that, that we did and 
he wasn't sure which way it went. And I went and looked up and record the dates we recorded. And I'd also made some notes on the recordings. I said, well, it started this way, but then it became this. And then after we that, we found out you could do the other thing. So next time we were in the studio, we went ahead and recorded that. So we have two recordings of this other thing. And, and, he, and he says, well, when are you going to write your book? He's just, he's just like amazed that I know all this stuff and have kept track of it all. So they, that's, that's another thing that's, uh, I'm not saying that's why I'm still the drummer. I'm just saying no, but it, that's also my involvement. You really bring something to the table with that. I mean, you really, you yeah. really do offer you know, that, that, that history of what, of what the band has done. That's amazing. Like, well, Sony, uh, who's the label that we were on for the last 15, 17 years, something like that, after Al left the label, now they own all the material. And with our blessing and cooperation, they issued a box set of 14, they have an LP version and a CD version. Mm. And there's a 15th LP with a bunch of rarities on it, some of which also came from me. So mm. I'm like the only guy that has clean copies of those things, for example. Yeah. So I had to you know, make sure those were nice and phased and just, you know, I made sure they were presentable and sent them off to Sony. Mm. But Sony also, they sent out two guys to the house a couple of times and went through all of my stuff with me, photos, boxes, posters, t-shirts, all sort of, they went through the entire archive. And one of the guys was a major Al fan. Who, this was like his pet project. So he was just like drooling over this stuff. Mike Duquette. And, and he was kind of my key contact there. I curated basically yeah. all of the material for like a 122 page book wow. uh, that came with this box set. And it's not just a box set, it's an accordion, a molded plastic accordion. And opens up, and the bellows that are the accordion are literally an accordion file. And that's where the 15 albums go. Uh, so it's a great package. I mean, it's just this incredible. And it's modeled after Al's accordion. They had me take pictures of his accordion, of all the emblems and all the words on the th It's They really did an amazing job on it. But my involvement with this book, and it's not the first time I've done kind of a book thing, was really, I, I handled all the credits in it because uh, I know where all the photos came from. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of fan photos of us on stage that they used. I made sure to get every name because I'm, I'm I'm meticulous too, and I didn't learn that from Al. And that's part of my success is, is we were already on the same page the way we do things. And the same with Jim and Steve. They already knew, hey, we're gonna do this song and it's gotta sound like that. It's like, we know how to do that. We, you know, we will do that. Now, we, it's not to say, you know, we look back and, and listen to Eat It from 1984. It's like, that doesn't really sound that close to Beat It. Yeah, yeah. But we got a lot better. <laughs> we got like scary better yeah. and fast. And, and I, I eventually got into sound design. I mean, it was more than just playing drums. I mean, I learn to program because we're copying songs that are highly produced, programmed, tweaked, uh, you know, and you don't know what sounds they're making. And yeah. it's not like, I know how to get that sound. I'll just sample that or cook it up or do. It's right. like, I, I have no idea. It's like, how do I make that sound? And it's like, I'll, I'll figure it out. And I eventually got, got pretty good. And, <laughs> yes. and I'm very proud. Our, our last four or five albums in particular, I mean, I'm very proud of anything I had to program and cook up sounds for them. I just I think I did a really really nice job. So we and we all grew. I mean everyone grew as, as this project because Al's agenda, his his thing was staying up with cutting edge production right. that's yeah. out there. You know cutting edge pop music, pop rap, whatever. And so we had to keep up too. You know we were always a little bit behind, but we were always chasing it and keeping up. And that and you learn that way. I, I was forced into doing stuff that way, and it's great. Yeah. I mean if if. If I wasn't the guy programming, if I hadn't bought a drum machine back in 1985, someone else would be programming drums for Absolutely. these records. I, I didn't like that idea. So that's a whole other skill that you learned. Oh yeah. You had that desire to learn this. So you widened your, your ability, your potential by being aware of that. That's a very important message for the future generation to see, the fact that you were open-minded enough. Open-minded, ambitious, uh, a little bit selfish. I didn't want someone else doing my job. I'm the drummer. Yeah. I'll, I don't care what the drum sound is, I'll make the drum sound. If I have to play it or if I have to push a button or whatever. Yeah. And that's and I just wanted to do that because I was that possessive of, of being a drummer. And I learned. Uh, I mean, I don't think I did any very uh, grievous you know, mistakes on things. I, yeah. think I, I think I did okay for where we were at. But again, I, I got a whole lot better. If I was to go back and do the albums we did in 85, 87, 89, uh, I, I would certainly do a better job. But we grow and we change. I think well, right. every artist can say that. But they, they look back at what they've done and how they, they have they grown to what they can change. But you have consistently played great. You've consistently hit oh, the road you. hard. You have really set a high standard with the fun music that, that, that the band is about. You know what? More important than anything, and I love playing drums, but it's got to be fun. Absolutely. It's not... It's really, and I do it for a living, but it's not about the money. I mean, I want to get paid, but yeah. I, you know, I do it because it's fun. If it stops being fun, I'm going to stop doing it. Yeah. It's not 
that important to, to be behind the drums and, and not like it. Well, that's very, very powerful. In closing, I mean, here we are at the sessions, and again, we have these, these people that are watching these and many names that you've mentioned, I want them to go and research these names. What would you say to this next generation that's out there listening that really wants to pursue their musical dream? What can mm. you guide them along the way to give them a path? They have to listen, that's the thing. They have to listen uh, with, with the internet, with YouTube, with whatever they can explore, and they should. They should explore, they should grow, they should learn. They gotta be aware of what went on before, because a lot of it's, for drummers, it's still going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm still playing a lot of the same stuff that Hal and Ringo and Charlie Watts and those guys played in the 60s. Yeah. And you know what? It's working. It works with a lot of today's music. You, you have to know what came before, you have to be ready for what's ahead, mm -hmm. you have to be in the now, you have to have a sense of working with other people. I mean, but that comes with experience. It's not enough to just say that. You have to, uh, you have to go out and get some experience. Go out and play with people. You know, I want to say try to be in the right place at the right time. We don't really know when that is, yeah. but, but you go out there. You do it. And the more you're networking, the more you increase your chances of finding the right place oh, at yeah. the right time. Well, networking is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be, you don't always have to walk around, hey, it's good to meet you. <laughs> a business card, call me if you need me. You know, it's as simple as just going to a local jam and just being seen and being heard playing. Yeah. And I always try and tell people, you know, and as such, if you're going to be there and people are going to be watching you, treat it like an audition. It's not a, a chance to cut loose and go nuts and do right. things you wouldn't normally do. Do the things you should be doing because someone's watching. Yeah. I've gotten a ton of gigs just from and unintentionally from guys that happen to see me you know playing the way I should be yeah. you know in a jam and just me having fun and it's like I, I like the way you handle it because they hear so many guys that don't do that yeah and that's networking and as soon as you exchange an email or a phone number or whatever that's the networking thing and and that's very important and it and it's cuz it's not about who you know it's about who knows you so you got to you got to get out there and get known boy that's fantastic advice and you know from the experience that you have and that you continue to do, you're still doing this at such a, at such an intense pace <laughs> of what it is, which is extremely exciting. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm over 60, and uh, which is not old. You know what? Yeah. It's not. Now that I'm there, it's like it's not old. It's yeah. not as old as I thought it was when <laughs> I was 30. <laughs> and and I'm I'm rocking harder and faster and playing better and and you know what? Probably enjoying it more uh, than ever. It just it keeps getting better for me. And, and which is good, because it's like some people, oh, you've been a pro drummer for however many years, are you playing with the same act for all these years? So you, don't you get tired, do you get bored, don't you ever? And, and I don't want to say I get bored, although I do play with a bunch of other bands in LA, but I, just because I like to play. Uh, you know, it's not like, I've had it with this, this funny music, I gotta play some real, you know, blues and rock. Yeah. And so I just, I like to play the drums. And, and, and that's, you know what, that's important. You gotta like it, you gotta, it'd be great if you love it, you, you, at least you gotta like it. You gotta, and then you'll be fine. And, and success is a very subjective word. I mean, it could be monetary. It could be getting out there and being known as, you know, all the, the young drummers look up to you or whatever, or yeah. are impressed with what you do. But it's, if you're doing something you like to do, I think that's success. And in that respect, I think I'm successful. Absolutely. Well, the fun factor continues. You are successful at what you do. On behalf of the sessions, John, we thank you so much. This has been just great. Oh, thank you, Dom. Thank <laughs> you so much. My pleasure.